Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Lane. I'm reading from John chapter 6, verse 61, the start of this devotional. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I share that passage because I'm going to be sharing about the theme of words, the words that we speak, but above all, the words of life, the words of eternal life, the words of the Lord Jesus. My wife Mary and I uh, watched a movie called Ophelia, which was a sort of slanted version of uh, uh, Shakespeare's play Hamlet and uh, looked at from uh, Ophelia's point of view and with some uh, changes, of course, to the script and modernised, didn't have Shakespeare in verse. And uh, it was well acted and quite well done and uh, certainly drew you to think I we, we both enjoyed it, though I, I'm sure if you're a pure Shakespeare lover, you would have struggled with some of the aspects of uh, the presentation of Hamlet, and particularly without Shakespearean uh, language coming through. Words, words, words. There. That's a verse from Hamlet. And um, after having looked at uh, Ophelia last night, I had to uh, turn to my bard in the Bible and browse some of the uh, lines on Hamlet, uh, as recorded here, of course, that most uh, well-known, famous one, to be or not to be, that is the question. And I uh, notice uh, that Bob uh, Hostetler uh, then goes on to refer to Philippians chapter 1 uh, as his uh, verse uh, linked in with that uh, well-known uh, phrase uh, from Hamlet, for me to live is Christ, said the Apostle Paul, and to die is gain. Well, I've uh, turned back to his comments on words, words, words. Here's what uh, Bob says in his little book, The Bard and the Bible. Polonius proposes a plan to Claudius and uh, Gertrude to test Hamlet's sanity. The prince often walks alone through the castle, so Polonius will arrange for Ophelia to confront Hamlet while the old folks hide behind nearby and try to gauge Hamlet's mental state. Claudius agrees just as Hamlet appears reading a book. The king and queen exit and Polonius goes to speak to Hamlet. When the old man asks the prince what he's reading, Hamlet replies, words, words, words. And uh, Bob's comment uh, goes on, well, duh, what does a person read? The line can, of course, be delivered any number of ways, but it seems intended to convey not only Hamlet's antic disposition, that's the phrase Shakespeare used, antic disposition, but also a weariness with books words, reading and study, perhaps like the author of Ecclesiastes who warned of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. But that is not true of all books or all words. And here we turn to John chapter 6, the passage I began with, where Jesus said, the words I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. And as he will go on 
Peter will declare, you have the words of eternal life. Notice Jesus didn't say, the words I speak refer to life, or the words I speak contain life. He said, my words are life. Words of Jesus, powerful, life-giving. We see that in uh, the incident of Jairus, his daughter. Jesus spoke to Jairus' daughter. She was raised from the dead. He called Lazarus out of his tomb. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man stood before them. Jesus' words breathed life into dying minds, hearts and lives. Not merely empty words, as it were, words, words, words. They are life. Jesus said, John 6, verse 63, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life certainly draws us to meditate upon the words of Jesus, upon the word of Scripture, the word of God. Well, as I reflect on this and think about our own gathering here at St Stephen's on Sunday, we're going to be standing and declaring our faith in words. And I mention that particularly because we will be saying the Nicene Creed this week, as we gather and share together in Holy Communion. And when we do so, the Nicene Creed is set, set down on those days, on morning prayer days, we'd normally say the Apostles' Creed. But this week it's the Nicene Creed. And aptly, the 19th of June or 20th of June, are set down because that is the day that the Nicene Creed was indeed finalised. And it's set down in this uh, little book I've referred to before on this day of dates, June the 19th, that is today's date that I'm sharing, I'm speaking, and we have uh, this reminder about how the Nicene Creed came into being. During the first three centuries of its life, the church suffered waves of persecution, the shackles, the lash, the sword, the teeth of lions. With the conversion of Emperor Constantine in three uh, 312 AD, the persecution ended and the church considered a problem worse than persecution. What could that be? It was heresy. A teacher named Arius from North Africa was denying that Jesus was both fully man and fully God. There was a time when the son was not taught Arius. He claimed that Jesus is not eternal, not divine, not God. The heresy grew. It alarmed Constantine. The emperor didn't understand the debate, but he desired unity in the church. These questions are the idle cobwebs of contention spun by curious wits, he said. And so Constantine called a general council of the church in the small town of Nicaea. 1,800 bishops were invited from across the empire. It's a real gathering, isn't it? 1,800 and each bishop was allowed to bring two other church leaders and three slaves. Travelling conditions were difficult, and fewer than 400 bishops assembled, most from Eastern Rome. So only 400 of the 1800. Many bore marks of persecution. Some were scholars, some were shepherds. And into this motley crew stepped Emperor Constantine, wearing... Uh, Quoting here, high-heeled scarlet boots, a purple robe, long hair and a short beard. The delegates were soon at each other's throats. Arius presented his views. Alexander and Athanasius retaliated with orthodox teaching. Finally, Hosius, a bishop from Cordova, suggested drawing up a creed. And the statement was, of faith was developed and Hosius announced it on June the 19th. 3.25. It described Jesus Christ as God from God, begotten not made, of the same substance as the Father, through whom all things were made, 
who for us men and for our salvation came down, was made flesh, was made man, suffered and rose again. And so the creed was adopted in the doctrine of Christ's divine nature, a belief both essential and unique to Christianity, was formally affirmed for the first time. And we continue to reflect the teaching of the scriptures as we say forth these words known as the Nicene Creed and affirm our faith, the Christian faith. As I think about this uh, uh, gathering of the bishops, I'm drawn to think about uh, the meeting known as GAFCON. I attended GAFCON in 2018, just on two years ago, and I share a, uh, at, at the GAFCON meeting, we had there was a cry that went forth. We will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations. We will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations. And after the conference, uh, Edward Lone, Ed Lone, I mentioned at the last devotional, uh, Marcus Lone, the former Archbishop. Well, Ed Lone is his great grandson. Uh, he's now at, a, he's been a teaching at uh, Moore College, but I attended his uh, uh, induction or installation as the new warden at St. Paul's College, uh, part of the, the college associated with, uh, with the University of Sydney, in between, uh, right next to Moore College there. I attended his uh, I think it was installation, whatever they call it, when you become a warden at uh, St Paul's just before uh, the lockdown uh, earlier on this year. I think it was in February or March uh, this year. Well, Ed Lone is a, a, a church historian and he uh, wrote uh, following the uh, GAFCON conference and linked it in with the Nicene, uh, the, the council at Nicaea. And here's what he wrote. About 1,700 years ago, on 20th of June, 325, so it's obviously 19th, 20th of June was the, the date, 318 bishops concluded a very significant meeting. Well, it's a bit less than the 400 bishops I had in the other book. Anyway, it's around uh, that number, 318 bishops. They had gathered in Nicaea because errors had arisen in the church which were so profound that they undermined the very foundation of the Christian message. Those bishops renounced the heresies and upheld held orthodox Christian doctrine which had been revealed by God through the scriptures. And on the 22nd of June, uh, Ed Lone notes on the 22nd of June 2018, that's just two years ago, 316 bishops, along with 669 other clergy and 965 laity, concluded another very significant meeting. They gathered in Jerusalem because errors have arisen in the church which were so profound that they undermined the very foundation of the Christian message. And those delegates renounced the heresies and upheld orthodox Christian doctrine which had been revealed by God through the scriptures. Those in Jerusalem were gathered from around the Anglican communion and represented the majority of that fellowship. It was the third uh, GAFCON, uh, the conference of the global Anglican future of the church, the Anglican church. And uh, as members of St. Stephen's know, Mary and I uh, attended. It was a, a wonderful time meeting there in Jerusalem and uh, sharing together. But Ed Lone asked the question, as this is the third GAFCON that has been held, a justifiable question is whether this conference will make any lasting difference in the way that the conference at Nicaea did, where we had, of course, the great Nicene Creed come out. Well, GAFCON continues to bear uh, influence. And uh, next week, there is an online celebration of GAFCON's ministry to global Orthodox Anglicans. And uh, Anglicans are being invited to join in a special service of word and prayer for the ministry of GAFCON in Australia and New Zealand and the neighbouring islands. 
in an online uh, celebration. And I've received notice of this and been told that there will be a 90 minute broadcast that will feature totally live interviews with special guests, Foley Beach, Ben Kwashi, Ashley Null, our own Archbishop, Glenn Davies, Richard Condy, uh, the Dean of Sydney, Kanishka Raphael, uh, Fiona McLean, David Cl Dave Clancy, with a live Bible talk from Jay the Hahn. Uh, it'll be hosted by uh, Jodie McKeel McNeil and uh, Jennifer Hercott with guests from local churches across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Jodie and I, uh, once you know, Jodie was, uh, when he was studying, was at, uh, a student minister at St Mark's Darling Point, and we were involved in a joint uh, youth ministry uh, when I was first uh, beginning here at St Stephen's more than uh, be at least some 20 or so years ago. Well, Jody's uh, down now at uh, Jamboree, uh, the rector there, or senior minister as we say these days, and uh, Jody is hosting uh, this broadcast that's on next week. And there'll be a discussion about the future of Aust Australasian Anglicanism, plus significant announcements about the future of GAFCON in Australia and New Zealand. Well, that's on next week and certainly something to be praying for. And indeed, may we in the Anglican Church proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations, a theme which has come through uh, in the devotionals this week as I've looked at the Apostle Barnabas and then Saul, who, of course, were the ones who went forward with the, the gospel in those missionary journeys and the gospel went forth from Antioch, sent out, to the nations and how we rejoice and give thanks to God that the gospel has come to our land, Australia. In that light, I close with what we have set down as our mission prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we call upon you for such an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us, upon us here in this land, Australia, that we as your people, here in this land, may be assured of your love through your word. Lord, we know the words of Jesus, the words of life. We pray that we might know that assurance of your love, that we might seek to be a people who please our Saviour in all things. And so we ask that you would Indeed, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we may show forth the godly life and that we may be filled with prayerful and sacrificial compassion for the lost in all the world. We do pray for your blessing upon the online celebration. This. There is a gathering next Wednesday and pray for your blessing in that meeting. And all this we ask in the name, the glory of Jesus. Thank you again for joining with me.
Side. 